Hello and welcome to Tuesday Live of the Nigerian Television Authority. Today we shall focus on impact of the federal government's social intervention program, investment programs on poverty alleviation in Nigeria and the sustainable efforts of taking 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in the next 10 years. The National Social Investment Program of the federal government is a social welfare initiative created in 2015 to ensure more equitable distribution of resources to vulnerable population to address poverty and help increase economic development. The NPAR program provides Nigerians with job training and education as well as a monthly stipend of 30,000 Naira and a conditional cash transfer program which directly supports the poorest of the poor by providing no string attached cash and to improve nutrition and self-sustainability. Others are the Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program for lending micro-investment program targeting entrepreneurs with focus on young people and women and the Home Grown Feeding Program which is aimed to increase enrollment and through quality meal to school children, particularly those in poor and food insecure regions. These efforts are judged as the best in the history of Nigeria on social intervention program committed to, to transform lives and improve the economic well-being of individuals and the country at large. Tonight on the program, we would take a sojourn into the tremendous impacts of federal government's investment programs and discuss ways of improving its components for sustainability and would have a team of experts to guide us. My name is Omini Oden. Before we begin, let's take this background report put together by Ruth Aguele. With a growing population of an estimated 200 million, the burden of ensuring a more equitable distribution of resources to vulnerable groups in the country is one the federal government took into consideration through the establishment of the national social investment programs to reduce hardship from the poor and vulnerable in the society. There are four components under the National Social Investment Program, namely NPAR Scheme, Conditional Cash Transfer, Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, and the National Homegrown School Feeding Program, which are all under the purview of the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development. The Conditional Cash Transfer is targeted at the poor and vulnerable groups in the society, with a disbursement of 5,000 Naira as monthly stipends to beneficiaries. And we buy one we use to buy food stuff and medicine. <laughs> Beneficiaries are drawn from the National Social Register. The National Homegrown School Feeding Program is targeted at primary school pupils with a specific focus on increasing enrollment in schools and reducing malnutrition, especially among the poor. <laughs> The Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, GIP, is a micro-lending intervention program that targets traders, artisans and farmers, having three sub-programs, trader money, market money and farmer money, with zero collateral loans as part of poverty eradication efforts. Where got my promise, not the field. Benefiting me for my business, for everything, for my anything why they do. The NPAR program was designed with a mandate to empower young Nigerians through capacity building, investment and direct support. So far, having successfully concluded batches A and B, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development launched the NPOWER Batch C program, taking a new dimension to ensure transparency and dynamic impact assessment of the program. The new approach will enhance a seamless verification process for all applicants and address irregularities. The NPOWER Batch C has launched today is structured to onboard 1 million new beneficiaries, beginning with an initial 500,000 beneficiaries in the first stream and a subsequent 500,000 in the second stream. It will now be administered through the National Social Investment and Information Management System, NASIMS, designed to optimize and complement the structural reforms of social investment programs. 
On the other hand, in ensuring that no one is left behind, the ministry has flagged off the federal government cash grant for rural women in the FCT, a program designed to provide a one-off cash grant of 20,000 naira to some of the poorest and most vulnerable women across the country towards eliminating extreme poverty. And this grant they have given us today, I so much appreciate. As the federal government continues to initiate policies for socio-economic development, it is hoped that these initiatives will put the nation on a path of steady growth and development. In Abuja, Ruth Aguile. Federal government social investment programs on poverty alleviation is the focus of the program tonight. Ruth Aguile's background report sets the tone for the takeoff of the program. In the course of the program, our phone lines will be open and displayed on the screen. Please, if we are true to you, go straight to the point, and in doing this, please turn down the volume of your television set. Also, you can be, be part of the program tonight through our social media handle, Twitter, at Tuesday Live NTA. Tonight, I'm being joined by, beginning with Abubakar Abdullahi Kure, Managing Director, Nestle Microfinance Bank. Good to have you on the program tonight. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being with you this evening. Also tonight, we've been joined by Ni Akinsiju. Ni Akinsiju is an investment analyst. Also on the program tonight is Paddy Eziala. Paddy Eziala is a communication and development specialist and also publisher and editor-in-chief development agenda. Welcome to Tizzy Live. Thanks for having me. For having me. Joining us via Zoom in Kenya is uh, Iowa Akpera. Iowa Akpera is a national coordinator, national social safety net coordinating office, NASCO. Good to see you on the program, Iowa. Thank you very much for having me. The, 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 but the last count, uh, you know, I'm beginning with you tonight, but the last count for an update, you talked about mapping, and you said if the total mapping of the register is completed across the country, a lot would have been achieved, and we hope and believe by now we are already there. At the last count, you said 22 states, now 32, including the Federal Capital Territory. You talked about uh, last figure, 1,132,679 poor and vulnerable households made up of over 4 million individuals. What's the update? So, um, as at uh, today, the social register has grown uh, to 30.1 million households across 36 states of the Federation and the FCT. It is made up of 31 million uh, households, 7 million. Sorry, I, I, uh, I sort of mixed it up. But it's made up of 7 million households, 30.1 uh, um, uh, million uh, individuals across 36 states of the Federation Political Worlds. Uh, 6,900 uh, 6, uh, or 699 local governments, I beg your pardon. Uh, so we are just uh, shut out of the entire country. And so uh, from the last time I was with you, Omi, uh, like you quoted very rightly, uh, we're yet to saturate the entire country, or be in all the 36 states. But now I'm happy to report that we are in all 36 households, uh, 30 million individuals in the social rights stuff. Okay, you are, I'll come back to you f for other perspectives. Now let's go to uh, Abubakar. Abubakar, you fall within one of the huge component areas within the, the program. And uh, clearly, yours falls within promotion, investments, uh, economic, and what have you. But there's always this confusion before we go into the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. Nessa Microfinance Bank and 
the other one, Nigerian Incentive Bank Risk Sharing System. Can you break it down? Yeah, so we you. understand it. Thank you. I think there are a lot of uh, misconception and confusion. Uh, even the press people, the media have interpolated the names, the picture between me and the MD. But principally, the other NASA is an institution that is designed to de-risk agricultural uh, product or the value chain for agricultural investment so that people will have encouragement around investing in agriculture. They are not a bank where well, we are a bank. We are supposed to do intermediation, take money, deposit from people, savings, current account, and lend to uh, SME people. So the fundamental difference is that we are a bank, uh, as a role as a bank, and they are the risk in agriculture. Our need come to be connected because we are a product of transformation of agriculture and so on. So we chunk out the product for the loss. They are supposed to de-risk our product so that the losses here in from assets that are created for loans will be reduced. So, but to some extent, they also do some loans in terms of uh, agricultural loans, like Ancobros. We also do Ancobros. We do SME loans. They don't do SME loans. So we take deposit from public. They don't take deposit from public. So let's go to specifics now. Yeah. NASA Microfinance Bank, how useful and beneficial impact on the nation's economy within the uh, programs of the social investment programs? Yeah, I think we have fared very well. I, I, I'm proud to say that we are part of the group that brought this country out of a recession, or we're about to get out of recession, because we are doing a lot of loans to for SME. We have various products which ordinarily commercial banks don't give, deposit banks don't give because of collateral, guarantor, and other preconditions. Here we are now, we have about five good products that average in general can say, you don't need to know anybody. All you need to do is go to our portal, you assess it, and once you qualify, the basic requirement is that you have a BVN, you don't have a fair credit check, you can enter what they call the credit facility, you can enter what to call AGMIS, is for agri business and other related SME uh, loans. We have also Ancoboros. And recently, too, uh, we are doing investment in youth. We have what we call youth investment scheme. It's actually targeted at youth so that youth can be employed, they can reduce poverty, and eventually the economy will improve. You know, youth are the engine of the economy. And it will reduce some of the insecurity we have in the country around robbery, kidnapping, uh, bandits. Boko Haram, and all other associated uh, atrocities. So that scheme is intended to invest in youth. And the, what we are supposed to roll out is also to take care of uh, those who are financially excluded because they don't want to do interest banking. So we, we have what's called interest bank coming on board very soon to take care of those who, are, who have bias around interest banking. So that one is more like... Islamic or non-interest banking. So for those groups that don't want to do this product, conventional banking product, they can now go into that product. So by so do we promote financial inclusion too, because those were actually excluded from financial inclusion. Okay, we'll come to other components, but quickly let's go to Ni Akinsiju. Ni, this whole thing is a huge deployment of various companies, but in summary, we look at it from the perspective of protection, prevention, promotion and transformation. Assessing it so far, would you say it has really permeated across board? The best uh, way to look at that is also to look at the history of uh, poverty in Nigeria. Um, uh, going, of course, by the statistics uh, provided by the National Bureau of Statistics. Um, as of 20, uh, 2012, uh, <clears throat> Nigeria had uh, more than 112 million people living uh, under one dollar a day. That's as of 2012. Uh, by now, um, by the last figure of uh, 2019, uh, the figure had reduced to 82.9 million. So by extrapolation from those figures, uh, what it tells us is that there had been a huge reduction uh, from what it used to be in 2012, when uh, out of a population of about 180 million people, uh, the percentage of very poor, uh, extremely poor, you know, was um, about 63%. Now, 
in 2019, when the latest figures uh, were issued, uh, it had fallen to about 40 percent. So. Uh, on the balance, one could say from extrapolation from those uh, from those numbers, um, the, there, there are obvious impacts. You know, uh, in terms of reductions, uh, reduction in numbers of uh, the, the the population of the very poor, um, and I, I, I think. <clears throat> The focusing of the programs in that suit is, is, is the, the bokeh approach, you know, to uh, to resolving the challenges of poverty. And I think there is a need to properly, you know, uh, provide perspective uh, to the issue of poverty uh, either globally in Nigeria. Uh, poverty is a developmental issue, and uh, to that extent, it means that it has it's it's is a burden, you know, on various aspects, various segments of the economy, and of course the social uh, existence of, uh, of people within the, the, uh, the country. So uh, by approaching and targeting the base of the pyramid as it were, uh, it, what, what it means is that uh, uh, the, the impact of this bouquet of programs uh, Lifting out those numbers from the base would, of course, be energizing the GDP of the country, and more than that, providing new potentials, you know, for a capacitation of the economy. So, to a large extent, I, I want to believe that uh, the the bouquet of programs, you know, had uh, properly impacted the economy, uh, properly impacted the targeted. Uh, the targeted community, and we can compare this to what we used to have, you know, before 2015, 2016, when this bouquet of uh, programs, you know, were rolled out. Uh, there was a time when the, the, the only focus was on providing a motorcycle, you know, uh, for as as a major uh, as a major uh, resolution. Uh, point, you know, for for uh, for poverty, uh, uh, motorcycle, uh, then it graduated to tricycle. Of course, this this uh, more or less disoriented the uh, the alignment, you know, that that should properly have applied in the in the consideration of uh, that challenge, because. Uh, when you give a graduate, for instance, or you give someone who had even gone through normal school and you made him uh, a motorcycle or a tricycle rider, what you have done is to depreciate his person. You are not adding value to that person at all. So, uh, and of course, it, also, it's, 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 it is also gender insensitive because how many women, you know, would ride motorcycles or, or tricycles in, a, in, a, in urban centers, for instance? For instance, so uh, these uh, the the bouquet of programs in the NSI NSIP is essentially multifaceted and multi-targeted, and uh, I also appreciate the NISAL, NISAL Microfinance Bank. We've been following what they are doing, uh, and we can see the obvious targeting, you know, of uh, of uh, the popular of their target market, and uh, uh, we we, are, we have also had testimonies, you know, of how people have been able to avail themselves the programs and products of uh, this uh, of this bank, and uh, and the truth is that I know two, three, four people that have said they applied without knowing anybody, and that is how it should be. Because for this kind of battle, it should, it should, take a, it should create a new culture in the Nigerian jurisdiction on how do we assess government uh, programs uh, and products as it were. Thank you so much. Paddy, before we go back to Iwakwera, this whole thing, like uh, Nia Akinji has said, Poverty itself is a developmental issue. And if you look at the entire programs, they cut across the entire value chain, agriculture, SMACs, name it. And being an environmentalist, a whole lot of beneficiaries are having what we call alternative livelihood option. If, for instance, I depend on the forest, say, hunting and government has given me some leverage to go into farming it means my attention is taken away from unsustainable forest management too so alternative level option and the social protection programs what is your assessment
Buddy, the question is for you. Well, Paddy, if you didn't hear me, I just simply said that being a huge deployment, this whole thing also talks about alternative livelihood option. How well will you assess its affectation on the economy? Because I have some experience with alternative livelihood systems when it comes to people whose livelihoods have depended on forest ecosystems for a very long time. If you look at Nigeria as it is now, you, since Lake Chad started drying up, it affected the local, the rural economy of Lake Chad, affecting 30 million people. A good chunk of these people are part of the people now living below the poverty line. You know, it's an environmental issue and uh, it should be recognized and uh, attended to. You know, uh, providing alternative livelihood for people who are already used to, to making uh, their livelihood from, from the lake. Uh, I understand that, the president, that President Buhari is leading the charge with regard to mobilizing efforts to recharge Lake Chad. That is big. But something has to be done to be able to, to ensure that the people carry on with life. You no, know, 30 million people, depending on a particular ecosystem, uh, now out of, out of job as it were. That's a very big one. It doesn't stop there. If you go to a place like uh, Cross River State or a Do State, it is the reverse. Because the economy is not as it used to be. People are now depending, descending on the forest, cutting down trees. We are now losing more trees. If you go and do your, your, your analysis, your uh, uh, grand do a survey uh, around Cross River, a Doaxis, Omo Forest, uh, as is in, in, in Ogun State, people are now cutting down trees indiscriminately. Before then, the statistics were not looking very good. We are losing a million point, uh, 1, 1. 1.5 million trees almost on a daily basis, 350,000 hectares on, on the daily. It's, it, it's, it's, it's really bad. Nigerians are not looking in that direction at all. So while poverty is a consequence of environmental degradation, it's also a cause of environmental degradation. Some of these interventions we are having from federal government have, have not uh, looked in that direction. That is one. But I must commend the efforts, the various programs the federal government have, has rolled out to, to ensure that uh, uh, things are better. But most importantly, the establishment of the National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office. That is great. Because these numbers are good. Just like when we had the, the, the peak of the pandemic and the government was intervening, trying to help out. The figures were not there. The numbers were not there. It was kind of haphazard. Even when it, 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 it made impact, it would have made more impact if they knew exactly who they were reaching out to. Now, with the existence, with the establishment of NASCO, uh, it's, it's, it's easier right now. So back to environment. Please, let us look at environmental consequences of this. How to go about it is trying to get the immediate, immediate intervention and then the long-term programs that will be able to reverse this. Living below poverty line is not a child's play. It's something that you, no book can be able to describe, it, be able to analyze. It is the person who feels it, who, he, who, who has issues, knows where it pinches. So, um, the government should step up action. Even when I appreciate what the government is already doing, there is need to step up action and do more. Look at also indigenous solutions to this. How did China lift 700 million people out of poverty within a short period of time, even to the admiration of their detractors? How did it happen? Um, cash transfers from experiences from Brazil and all that, it works. It works, but we need more permanent solution to these things. Fiscal policies, are we doing it enough? Are rich people in this country paying enough tax? Because this is what we're expecting the government to do. They need resources to do that. And they have to look for resources anyhow, provide the funds, and make sure 
that these bridges, uh, that we bridge these gaps. The gaps are really huge. They have to be bridged. And the government is doing, making enormous effort, but I think we need more. Thank you so much. Let's go back to Akwera. I hear his audio is very audible now. Akwera, your first opening uh, line of thought was giving us an update on what the mapping is all about. And if you are giving us this update, in order to confuse the entire thing, the entire program are put into four major parcelated areas. I talked about protection, prevention, promotion, and transformation. So now, so far, in summary, what's the update in terms of those who have been uploaded, beneficiaries, and the resultant output so far? So me, um, I think we, we, let, let's start from back from when I started and the question around the update of the social register and perhaps why uh, the federal government of Nigeria is going the route of developing a social register. Uh, first, the, the social register itself is an information gateway uh, for potential eligible beneficiaries into any social intervention program. Now, the government started the efforts of developing the social register uh, since 2016. And to date, we have uh, 7 million households, uh, 30 million individuals across the 36 states of the Federation and the FCT. Now, government uses the social register to target social intervention. Government has built the capacity of this register across the country that has interest across across different players. So not only government that it's mining, but poor and vulnerable from the register to pay the cash transfer of 55,000, the likes of United Nations Women is mining from the social register, female-headed households to pay cash transfer to. UNDP, it's mining from the social register to also do a cash transfer across 20 states. Now, this is the efforts of the government. And I agree with you, um, for the past decades or so, this is by far the most ambitious investment of any government in our country targeting poverty and poverty alleviation. But we have to also make some bit of distinction. So you have the social inve investment programs and then the suits of Empower, Jeep, Homegrown School Building Program, targeting various economic problems, including uh, school enrollment, as in school feeding program, improved nutrition, uh, cheap targeting small businesses, giving them loans to stimulate uh, economic growth, um, empower providing learning and experience for our graduates and undergraduates, giving them um, uh, some, some form of skills to continue with their life. And of course, the cash transfer itself, which is a, a, an economic uh, stimulus act, uh, initiative that aims at stimulating or smoothening consumption. Now, when you look at the question of smoothing consumption, which is coming to your question about transformation, um, uh, the type of initiatives, the cash transfer, probably um, it's uh, just one, um, the only one amongst the four in the sense that it, it does target the poor, the, 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 the lowest on the uh, poverty pyramid. And when you target such individuals or group of people uh, with uh, cash stipends as it is global best practices all around the world, which my colleague mentioned, Brazil and co, what you are doing effectively is your smoothing consumption, your raising demand, and your enhancing um, your uh, uh, your stimulating a whole chain of activities that ensure economic growth. What do I mean by this? When you give five thousand naira to a poor and vulnerable household, evidence in Nigeria from the program we are uh, uh, rolling out shows that seventy percent of that money is used for consumption, which is food stuff. And by that, you raise a huge demand for whatever food stuff or food products that we have, this, uh, the, 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 they are consuming out there. And by raising demand, I'm not an economist, but elementary economics would tell us that supply has to meet demand. And when supply needs to be uh, meet of demand, they will stimulate production. And when they stimulate production, they will increase uh, opportunities 
the companies will have to employ, government will have to have more revenue from taxes paid by these companies, and the whole chain of economic activities are blown up. When you look at the impact of it, a few examples exist, exist out there. In Quara State, the latest news uh, in Quara State that the governor went to a primary school to take over the school. This school was built by women who have been collecting 55,000 naira cash transfer from government over the last two and a half years. These women contributed this from this 55,000 naira and built a whole classroom block. They employed the teach teachers and started a school in their in their locality. Help ensuring that their children are no longer walking long distances from school, but it's, being, it's just by, by, their, by their doorsteps. And when this thing made news, the governor of Quara State reacted, and rightly so, to take over the school, get more teachers, get buildings there, and refunded these women money up to 500000 uh, 500, or 5 million naira thereabout. Now, this is just a small impact of it. Now, if women... and we can argue that what will 5,000 naira do? But when you put 5,000 naira together from women who have been collecting this cash transfer, and in that community, there are not more than 30 women who are collecting this cash transfer on a monthly basis. So from a 30 women point of view, to have built a school and also employed a teacher over the last two and a half years, we just tell you the simple um, impact of programs like this. But if you also imagine that you have the 30 women collecting 5,000 naira in a village. 5,000 times 30 brings up to about um, 150,000 or 1.5 million years. And now that is money injected into that community. Community we hated to would hardly have that much of liquid cash pumped into that community. But this is consistent. It's monthly over two and a half years. So you just imagine the kind of economic activities that have started coming up in that particular community. You, you will imagine that there will be shops opened, there will be uh, vehicles more coming there more frequently because there are the merchants are going there frequently with, with wares to sell, and so it boosts that economic life. Now they have a school, they have teachers, of course not, um, they, they, they would have had the graduates or people from NC who are from that village who have um, graduated, no jobs, so they are back in the village. Wow, they have jobs, about three or four of them employed, and now the government has taken over and has given them jobs. So this is what the impact of social safety nets programs or social investment programs is in Akaja. I mean, we have loads of social stories for Empower, uh, where close to 60% of the beneficiaries of Empower has gone ahead uh, to invest from the 30,000 naira stipend they've collected over two years to grow their own businesses. Some have won scholarship abroad uh, with, with, with their startups in, in technology. So the, it, 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 the, the, the gains are there and they are bound. Now, the school feeding program, for instance, the school feeding program, it's in three ways. It's a homegrown school feeding program. Homegrown school feeding program, the homegrown component means that we are deliberately investing in our agricultural food value chain. The food that they cook for these students are locally sourced. Now, that means we are boosting or encouraging agriculture because they will have to produce the food that will be bought. And then we've gone ahead with the program to have aggregators. So for instance, eggs. They buy eggs from these farmers ensuring that they have value, ensuring that are, the waste is minimal, and where they do not exist, encouraging others to come in because there's a ready market. Uh, and this market is consistent. It's every day of school, three months every quarter, over uh, the, the four quarters of the year that schools are open. And then the women that are employed to cook, what happens to their economy? They have jobs. They are paid for the food that they, are, uh, they, they, they cook, giving them income, helping their families, putting their children to school, and of course, stimulating local economic growth in that community as well, because these women are not going to go to the city to buy the, the things that they used to cook. They're going to buy it in the local stores. And so opening that community for, for business, as well as farmers. Then you, when you talk about cheap, 
and the small loans that they are given, up to 50,000 naira or thereabout, you see small, small businesses, you will not imagine what 2,000 naira does to an Akara woman, a, a woman selling Akara on the street. How much does she need to start her business? Perhaps 2,000 or 3,000 naira. An additional 10,000 naira to that woman ensures that she's going to buy perhaps a bag of beans or maybe have a bag of beans, ensuring that she's buying perhaps at wholesale and no longer retail. And so her profit does increase because she's buying more in quantity than just going to the shop and buying 10 10 naira at retail price, at retail cost, which is about third hand um, uh, uh, retail uh, structure. And so it cuts her cost of doing business by increasing the stock. And so there's more profit for her to expand her business. She's got a little bit more income to take care of her own family. And also, in the economy, if you look through uh, a community, you're injecting cash of up to two, three million naira every month. We can just imagine the impact of that in the local uh, economy. We can stay in the city of Abuja and Lagos and argue that that's not much, but if you go to actual real uh, communities, it's a huge, huge, huge impact that these programs are making out there. And the value is there for all of us to see. And I'll say again that this is by far the most ambitious investment of government. Now, what has government done to sustain this? Apart from the fact that they're building the social register, which in itself, it's for the first time establishing a list of identified poor and vulnerable where we can and point to them, we can get help to them easily. And the approach is top, but at the bottom up, wherein it is the community that are identifying the poor and vulnerable. It's not any politician sitting in any parliament or any city. It's the community members that identify these poor. In our community, these are those who are poor. This is how we define poverty, and these are those who are poor. These are the people that are in the register. The government has then gone ahead to establish uh, the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development, where in itself it's a structure we meant to institutionalize the programs and make them far more enduring. Now we have a house, we have a social protection implementing uh, coordinating agency that begins to put the learnings, the systems together to ensure that going forward, we have structures and systems. Now, the government also didn't stop there. When the pandemic struck, the most impacted and affected by the pandemic are the urban poor. So the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Saidi Omar Farouk, then directed my office, of course, which is directly under her supervision and the Permanent Supervision, that what can we do to ensure that the urban poor are also within reach to be helped? And so she came up with the Rapid Response Register. And the Rapid Response Register is simply a mechanism that targets the urban poor onto a database that help reach them in a very transparent manner. And we're using state-of-the-art technology for the first time again in our country. We're using electronic end-to-end. -end. We're using a very scientific method of targeting that ensures that we're using satellite imagery to define or map the urban poor areas, where the urban poor live. And who are these urban poor people? They are the artisans, the bricklayers, the tailors, the taxi drivers, the uh, small businesses that reside in, in, in our various communities. So we will go back home in Abuja, people that stay in, say, um, Nyanya and Co, um, or, 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 or um, Pape, those kind of suburbs. Are, those are the kind of targeted areas that this satellite imagery uh, technology has provided us access to. And through SMSs, we are then targeting them and bringing them onto uh, the social register, uh, the uh, rapid response register. Government itself are already earmarked um, and money to target for cash transfer to this transcend poor that then helps them give them a bit of relief that puts them on the path of recovery uh, from the shock. Okay, Akpira, let's hold it there for now. Before we take our reports, let's come back to Kureg. MD, Mesal is about agricultural financing. You have tried to separate the difference between 
the National Microfinance Bank and the, the bigger picture, but it's all related. Now, you used a word, would-be beneficiaries do not need to, to know you yeah. to benefit. Now, how would people become beneficiaries? Okay, um, we have a website uh, which you can visit via the internet. You just go there, apply. Once you apply, there's evaluation process for application. We have different set of loans. For instance, the first one that is a success story is uh, what we call COVID loans, or that is referred to target credit facility. So what that means is that that loan is generated to mitigate the impact of COVID. During the lockdown, people lost their jobs, business are closed down, there are no cash flow. So in order to activate business and people, uh, Central Bank is region came out with that scheme. So what we need to do is just assess us via our portal. We also have admins too, agriculture related. The other COVID is for all businesses. It could be for commerce, for restaurant, for entertainment, for hospitality, for medical. So along those value chain, you can apply. We have agri value chain too, and also related to SME, it can be tailoring, it can also be commerce, it can be uh, restaurant and whatever. So what you need to do essentially is to go to our portal. So the major, major identification that we need here is what we call BVN. It's a unique identifier and that serves as a collateral. Because if you don't pay, Central has came out with a scheme, uh, what they call global standing instruction. Irrespective of where your account is located in a bank, in the banking system, once you default, paying back the loan, will activate that platform and your account will be debited and our account will be credited for recovery. So uh, that is just the collateral that is required. And in so doing, too many, many people have gotten it, which ordinarily, uh, under the normal conventional banking, there's no way they will have had access. So that have helped people reduce poverty, that help people get jobs, that have also uplift standard of living. And uh, eventually, uh, the households are happy, and uh, Nigeria is also getting improved. Because the idea of is to give cheap credits to those at the lower segment of the society. Just like the last speaker said, ours is not a social intervention, but the major objective is to look at the lower people, at the economic ladder, so that they can come up and be at least a middle class family. If they use that funds well, I must iterate, it's not a uh, grant. It's a loan, and that's why I say the BVN is your collateral. So it's better people should know that you should utilize it effectively. You should use it to generate income, asset that can generate income, not acquiring liabilities that you'll be putting expenses on. Because I know some people that have taken to save, uh, that they have done very well by buying, for instance, uh, uh, Ketena Pep or even uh, uh, Uber. And they have done fantastically very well. Because once you do that, by the time you are spending money, the economy is also having a multiplier effect. And, uh, How accessible are you talking about your availability and, and also affordability? For instance, you are based in Abuja. Yeah. Do you have offices up to the lowest rung of the rural areas where people can easily access yeah. your services? Yeah, we have. As at moment, we have over 100 uh, locations across the country. The target is to go to all the local governments, that's about 774. Uh, with the support of the government of CBN, we hope to achieve that. Because the idea is to get closer to the people. Because the agenda is to provide cheap loans to promote financial inclusion. And uh, so that those are the lower segment, those that have poverty, as long as they use the money very well. So even if you say you cannot access via internet, uh, the physical presence of our office, you can go there, they will help you assist you to be able to apply for the loan. Let's say your level of literacy is low. We have also considered that. And the idea of having physical presence, we have done agency banking, but we felt that we need to combine both the agency banking and physical presence. Currently, we are in all the states of the Federation. And the agenda is to spread to all the local government, but that is going to be in phases. Uh, the next phase might be maybe another uh, more locations that will reach let's say 200, and gradually we might reach the eventual target of 774. Because it's going to be a vehicle for SME. And in most developed countries, SME are the engine of growth because they employ larger number of people. 
they contribute more to gross domestic product, and uh, they generate people to move or migrate from the lower economic ladder to the middle class. So basically, um, we hope that with the support of the Manual Central Bank, uh, which has also always been supporting us uh, uh, to embark on those loans, we'll be able to achieve those targets. Before we take our first report and then go to Padi Eziana and uh, Niya Kinsiju, uh, how possible is it? It's not just about giving out money. Do you have a mechanism where you do a follow-up to know how this money is used as much as it is not free money? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, honestly, the job is challenging, I must say, because you are dealing with volumes. Conventional banks don't deal with volumes. They deal with high value. But here, our own is reverse. High volume, low value. So uh, we are set up as strategies around recoveries. We have a recovery team, but more importantly, we have to be doing it in a cost-effective manner. I do expect somebody to start visiting some for 500. So what we are trying to do is deploy technology around SMS, around email, uh, and possibly we'll also look at the business development centers who can help in the recovery, whether it's a medium or long term. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, uh, the, our firm as it is now, and given the number of loans we have done, the capacity around recoveries is limited. So we have to depend on technology and other third parties, if possible, to make recovery. But as I've said also, the major collateral is that BVN. Uh, as long as we have money in the banking system, we're going to recover our money. Because it's not a grant, it's a loan. OK. We we'll begin with our reports, and our first report tonight is coming from Lagos. Poverty and high rates of unemployment are two socioeconomic realities that can create a lot of imbalance in any society. The federal government was obviously mindful of this truth when, in 2016, it launched various schemes targeted at promoting self-reliance and providing safety nets for the vulnerable in the society. In the last five years, special intervention component of the National Social Investment Program, such as homeschool feeding for pupils in public schools, conditional cash transfer to the poorest of the poor, trader money and empire have addressed specific mandates with positive results. Apart from being a couple, Matthew and Mary have few other things in common. They both teach at a family-owned private school, Leveraging teaching and management skills they acquired during their four year stint as beneficiaries of the federal government youth empowerment program and power. Those knowledge acquired during that time, I'm able to transfer them into what I'm doing presently. And it has really helped in uh, improving the business I'm having currently. We taught a lot of things about the school records, how to handle them. Although they are no longer on the payroll of the federal government, Matthew and Mary want the federal government to not only sustain the intervention, but also fine-tune it. They promise us that we'll never go back to the streets. We are still holding firmly to that. Even as government works to expand the program with the induction of additional 500,000 beneficiaries into batch C of the scheme, federal government agencies are giving more meaning to the investment with technical support. We even have what you call the cl uh, cluster resettlement, where you put them together, get a place for them, and they start their businesses. They are acquiring a technology. They are giving a startup sum of money. A minimum of 200, I mean 100,000 for each participant. Apart from Empire, which the likes of Matthew and Mary described as a necessary stopgap, other packages, such as Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program and 75 billion Naira Youth Investment Fund, are also touching lives. From Lagos, we move to May degree. National Social Investment Program, NSIP, get to lift the standard of living of the indigents, is making impact in Borno states. NPA is one of such programs which Idris Mohammed, one of the beneficiaries on the entity, saved from his monthly stipends to open this electronic shop named after NPA and now employer of labor. I have six people that they are working on that. I have canopy rents. I normally used to pay them monthly and then there is some is weekly. For those that they are coming, especially but see. So please, they should try and make good things in their future. Other programs by federal government to tackle poverty and vulnerability. Our National Agricultural Land Development Agency, NALDA, 
micro lending intervention for traders, farmers, women and youth, as well as cash transfer and food distribution as COVID-19 palliative, among other interventions. This is a continuous uh, program. It's something that the ministry is mandated to do. But for this is specific, it's targeted at uh, poor and vulnerable rural women. The cash to be transferred will help to empower all the beneficiaries and strengthen their financial inclusion based for livelihoods. We have many interventions of federal government. This form is from the presidency, the National Agricultural Land Development Authority, NALDA. Right now we have trained the first set of 262 people. Use. Some of the beneficiaries have made good use of the opportunity to increase their income, enhance food security, and contribute to the economic of the state and the nation. The National Social Investment Program put in place by this administration has already placed many youth and women on springboard of economic success, being the most considered by the program. Our next stop is Benin Edo State. Like most Nigerian graduates, Masage Rustin Otamere, a 2013 estate management graduate of Alchi Polytechnic, had the dream of working in a reputable estate firm or government establishment. But two years after graduation and completing his national service, there was no job in sight. Hearing about the launch of Empire Program by the federal government in 2016, however, his story changed. Because of the help from Empower, so I was in Enagro. So with the help of being in Enagro and um, Edo ADP, whom were delegated to teach us the agricultural stuff, so I was able to know everything, most of the things about agriculture. With the training and empowerment received from the federal government and agro program, Wasage and other beneficiaries working at this Ute fish farm cluster are not just self-employed, but are also creating business and employment opportunities for others. Like where we are right now, the people that are employed are even more than the farmers themselves. Similar to the story of Masage is that of Helene Ekaro, whose business was at the verge of closing down, but for the financial support she received through the federal government's trader money program. The money helped me well, well, and I make my market not fall. That money they paid at that time, we gathered it together, but that to two months, four months, we finished it for 20000 We said, I said, let's go and do something. I called my wife. I said, what can we use this money for? I said, let's go and blow a bush so that we can plant cassava and all whatnot. Uh, the money helped me well, well. He helped me help my family. I use at the trade. He still helped my family. The money I received for government, I used it to start the crayfish business. But during the period of COVID-19, you know, not going anywhere. We are just staying at home. So we, we use the little money that I have to feed. They are of the view that these social investment programs should be sustained to touch the lives of many poor and unemployed Nigerians. <laughs> And on the first belt, our last port of call is Kano. Social investment program by the present administration in the year 2015 has no doubt impacted positively on the livelihood of many here in Kano states. For instance, the Households of Lifting Program, which is one out of the four components of the program currently run in the state, has more than 100,000 beneficiaries. Take the example of Maimuna Sani from Kura, who processes 100 kilograms of paddy rice every day, or Harira Muhammad from Rangi Community, who has been serving. Yes, it is through this government of Muhammad Buhari that we found something. Prior to this intervention, people of this community traveled kilometers away for their grinding needs, had to reach areas which are listed among the target areas are also not left out as the officials under the scheme travel to ensure right beneficiaries are captured. The Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development 
I uh, did not forget the Dabo community, in fact. So we are very grateful. And uh, as you can see, it's very hectic and it's a very far far to reach area. Well, recently we had a registration for this BATC, which I can, I can proudly say in the whole of this country we have the highest number of uh, registration. The six-year-old program, according to Harira and her lights, has changed their economic fortune and their entire livelihood. When we come back after the break, we shall be looking at as much as this program cuts across difficult to reach areas and areas that are easy to be reached, has there been a creativity, job creation and enterprising culture in the country with these programs? And if it is doing well, if the M&E is not effective, how well will it go after the break? should not mask your beauty. The primary purpose of a face mask is to protect the wearer from bacteria, dust, pollen, and viruses such as COVID-19. But now that face mask has become part of our daily wardrobe and accessories, Transgreen Nigeria Limited is introducing O-Care Colors. O-Care Medical Face Mask now comes in different colors to match your unique style and different attires. O-Care Medical Face Mask is comfortable to wear, easy to breathe through, and does not leave marks or rashes on your face and can be specially branded to suit your taste. You can get your Old Care Medical Face Mask today from pharmacies and supermarkets near you. Old Care. Protection you can trust. Old Care. Coronavirus is real. Steps to avoid this pandemic. Wash your hands regularly or sanitize your hands. Keep social and physical distancing. Avoid crowded places. Stay at home unless absolutely necessary. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth if your hands are not clean. Avoid the spread of coronavirus. Coronavirus is real. Innovation talk show. Thanks for staying tuned. I will begin here with Ni Akinsejo. Ni, uh, before now, it used to be a picture of government just giving out handouts for people to just eat and walk away. But we see a picture of government teaching people of how to become entrepreneurs. If today the world is talking about value chain development, value addition, would we say we are heading somewhere in terms of enterprising, job creation, and entrepreneurship in a couple of years? I, I will conclude from your conclusion. <laughs> I, I believe that we are heading somewhere. Uh, first, because of the philosophy of uh, those programs, as it were. Uh, but most importantly, um, when a program of this nature or of the nature, you know, of uh, the, the bokeh we're talking about. And, uh, of course, we've, we've been talking so far about the social investment program. There's also the need for us to bring in the economic stimulus uh, plan, too. You know, there are a number of programs under that, uh, uh, that uh, thematic uh, umbrella, as it were, too. So if we take all that together, what distinguishes them is the fact that they are, they, are in, they are pivoted on uh, a bottom-up approach. So it's based on 
first the community, where we're talking about the social register for the cash transfer and all that, is based on the community identification and, of course, community monitoring too. And for most of the other programs, at the level of the JEEP, you know, at the level of the mixed uh, similar uh, programs too, you're looking at belonging to corporations, I mean, to cooperatives, you know. So uh, it's just one or two of those programs that you have individuals uh, doing direct uh, uh, application, you know, uh, to get into the program. So the, 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 first, uh, the, the first layer, you know, of being involved in the program is that you belong in an association, you belong in a cooperative, and the cooperative as itself is also self-regulating because uh, the, the basis of securing, uh, the securing credit, as it were, it's based on the collective, you know, of the cooperative. So uh, to pay back and all that would also uh, would also be based on the collective of the of the cooperative. That I also don't also forget that we have a, a strong history of cooperatives, you know, uh, in in Nigeria. So uh, the the linkage between government programs and uh, and cooperative uh, self regulating uh, capacity has created a new an ecosystem that that more or less you know, helped you know, uh, the realization of, this, of these programs. Now, these pro cooperatives, too, are also usually artisanal-based, you know, or trade-based, kind of. So already, they have, they have functioning within an industry. So by linking them up with credit, it's just, yeah, it's just I mean, enhancing and empowering the cooperative as it were. So you cannot, for instance, uh, uh, collect something if you are not if you are collecting something for furniture making it's likely that you belong in the cooperative of carpenters or furniture makers so you are already uh, you are already professionalized and of course like the uh, the end power uh, it got the time now that we, now we also saw a stratification along profession and, and industry like the end the agro the end the agro and all that it's if you are not uh, involved in agricultural practice before, you were exposed, you know, to, to agricultural practices and all that, and it goes along the, the value chain as it were. So what I'm trying to say essentially is that uh, this is not just about throwing money at a problem or throwing money at challenges to resolve those challenges. It is, I, I see a clear, systematic, you know, approach, you know, to uh, not only to resolve the challenges of poverty, you know, but of course to also grow, you know, uh, people out of uh, out of the poverty uh, community as it were. Then uh, if you also look at the, the whole poverty uh, universe in, in the country, uh, if we if we are talking about 82 million 900 thousand uh, people living now under one one dollar ninety cent, because by 2015 the benchmark uh, for global uh, poverty line was increased from one dollar under one dollar uh, to one one dollar ninety cents. Uh, now uh, at 82 900, you still have those who are living under four dollars. Those who are living under five dollars, those those living uh, uh, on those on those income, it, either you are measuring by income or you are measuring by expenditure, are still on the margin line. They are, you you can't you know, describe them as being uh, as being rich as it were. So uh, there's still a need to keep pushing them, you know, into into the higher rank higher rung of the economy. And I think that is what these other programs are doing, either at the level of the targeted credit facility that uh, the, uh, the CBN is doing uh, through the NISAR, uh, through the artisanal uh, one-off grants, I think 30,000 30, or so, uh, through housing, uh, social housing. Uh, now, if I, received, I received an approval, you know, or rather a notification to the fact that my uh, the the social house, you know, that I applied for under this economic stimulus plan is being processed, you know, and uh, I didn't know anybody. I just I, I saw the uh, the the thread and and the link, and I applied. I've been informed now that uh, about six, I mean four. Uh, four locations in, in Abuja have been have been developed, and if I have interest, I should open an account, you know, in a, in a, in a mortgage in the Federal Mortgage Bank and all that. So, 
I have not spoken with anybody. I just made that application direct. Now, I have also known some people you know, that applied for uh, uh, for the solar energy uh, the solar energy projects, you know, uh, through the Rural Electrification Agency, uh, which though that one is limited to people of certain uh, age, on, I mean, youth, youthful age under 35, you know. But what I'm trying to say essentially is that when a program is properly focused as it were, and it's situated, you know, within the universe of a bottom-up approach where the community or the uh, cooperative groups, you know, are, are directly involved, it will help, you know, won't sustain the program and of course give it a proper exit as it grows you know it, into into uh into its true realization okay, thank you now paddy in your opening you try to dwell within the ambit of environmental issues let's come back now to the clear picture you said it is about government spending money. But if the government makes money available and the people who are supposed to benefit are not presenting themselves to get benefits from it, what advice will you give in a kind of M&E for those who are still laid back? They don't want to pick interest in this program. Paddy Eziala, please. Skepticism is everywhere. People question a lot of things, be it uh, COVID-19, be it the vaccine, be it whatever people que uh, question. Um, there should also be a communication angle to all what is going on, to persuade people, even when it is in their interest. Nigerians want to be persuaded to benefit from government programs. Uh, not only benefiting people's participation, also encourages government to even do more. You see, so um, the only thing I can say is that people should ask questions. How are these things done? How do people benefit? Um, I am one of those who have not been quite satisfied with the performance of local governments across the country. If they keyed into these federal government programs, people could easily go to local governments to see how they can be able to be part of what's going on. I do not expect people from local government to be looking up to federal government in Abuja to see what's going on, to be able to key in. Uh, I wouldn't know how much that has been done by the local governments to sensitize people at rural levels. Every local government, they have, there are structures, even in communities, in the part of the country I come from, there are development unions, women organizations, and things like that. This information should be passed down the line. Yeah, my partner here, a colleague, has said that the bottom top approach of the whole thing is really is fantastic. And uh, if there is this bottom approach to it, uh, bottom top approach to it, uh, there is the, it's, 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 it's kind of given that people at the grassroots are fully aware of what is going on and they can key in properly. It is tragic, it is horrible if federal government makes provisions to, to support people and they, out of ignorance or skepticism, they are not uh, able to key in uh, fully to benefit from this program. So I'm using this opportunity to tell Nigerians wherever, wherever they are that uh, some programs are on, they should ask questions, they should be educated, they should be able to, to benefit from them. You know, they are numerous. You don't benefit from one, you can go for the other. That's just what I have to say. Thank you so much. And our first caller tonight is on. We hear Uma is calling in from Benin Kebi. Hello, Uma. Yes. <coughs> My name is Omar Anati, calling from Benin Kebi. Go ahead, please. You see, we can hear you. Go ahead, Uma. But it looks we have lost that call. Maybe we'll call back. Now, quickly, let's go to a couple of tweets have come in. And uh, the first two, clearly, we'll take it to Iwa Akpera. Iwa Akpera, you can hear us from your location. The first one is coming from Victoria. I said, good evening, sirs. I am, Mart Sorry, I'm, I'm, I am Martins from Adwe Kitty. What happens to some of the poverty alleviation scheme being sponsored by the federal government, such as survival funds and the rest? Many applicants have not yet been paid. And follow up, it says, the next one is Efra Faduk founder one. It says, hi everyone, nice to join you. 
my contribution for tonight's topic is if government really wants to alleviate poverty in our society, let me and you start helping our neighbors to reduce it by investing within our community. But everybody holds what he has and blaming government always. Let's allow your respond to this, please. I think um, the government, uh, various government initiative under the economic stimulus um, uh, plan, uh, the ESP plan, like the survival fund, is still ongoing. Those who have applied um, will be will be reached, um, and they've been in batches, and a lot of people are getting it. Um, and it's a, a stimulus package for the uh, COVID uh, that is going on. Um, and I agree with the last tweet. I mean, um, what government has done is first to lay the foundation to identify the poor, and the poor, the identified poor uh, vulnerable register is there for every a corporate body, individual or government uh, to mine and provide help to the poor and vulnerable people. And it has been done in a way and a manner that is transparent that it has um, enhanced uh, confidence of uh, major players in, in, in within the social protection ecosystem to uh, begin to mine this register and, do, and, and, and help people. And so the, the data is there. Uh, it's also available. Uh, others have been using it, like the European Union suits of, uh, of programs in the Northeast. In UB State, we have uh, a message call using mining the social register and doing cash transfer for, for displaced persons, poor and vulnerable. You have international National Red Cross, you have World Food Program doing the same in Zamfara, you have UNICEF doing it in uh, Sokoto, uh, you have Save the Children in, in Yobe, uh, and a host of other um, uh, international organizations and donor agencies who are mining from this register and providing help. Now, when you look and you try to gauge the total number that have been accessing care or accessing support through uh, the structure on the system, you will see uh, the quantum of the impact of, of, of this. But also to also add that, it also provides a basis for us to quickly activate some of our programs that we are also um, uh, perhaps uh, on the load side in terms of startup. Now we have the Community Health Insurance Scheme, the National Health Insurance um, a scheme uh, at the national level directing all its, its offices nationwide to mine from the social register to provide community health insurance to our poor and vulnerable. And you see all state government social uh, health in, uh, insurance scheme are mining from this social register because they have a defined um, uh, 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 database to identify those who actually uh, could be reached with this help. And that is why I also agree with my colleague Paddy and the rest on the panel that the bottom of approach really ensures um, that the right people are being targeted. It builds confidence in the system. It also ensures that the right people are getting help that they should get. And collectively, this investment are beginning to pay off in some of the success stories that we hear, even in some of the clips that you've shown. But in the next two, three, four, five, six years, you will see how collectively this can impact very heavily in our economy. And it is also uh, the basis for um, uh, structured support in uh, issues in, in, in times of crisis like the pandemic. Uh, we hear best practice from other countries of the world, the United States giving cash grants or cash uh, uh, transfer to its citizens as a way of uh, putting them back on for growth. And so it is everywhere. So now we have the basis to do it. And so it's more time for us to believe more in our government and to believe that the current administration has invested heavily in the poverty question of the country. And like my colleague also said, let's ask questions, let's participate. And the last tweet hit it right on the head to say, 
let's also do our quota. Now you can actually, in your village, Omi, I know you're a very rich man, Omi, you can actually come and mine uh, the poor, identify poor and vulnerable in your village and begin to give them uh, health insurance that is about 3,000 naira per annum for, for all of them to access health care for free, for instance, or uh, start those small, small businesses of 10,000 10, naira. You have people who are actually poor and need this money that have been identified by their own community as people who don't have the capacity to do so. All that international organizations are doing it. At the moment, we have close to 17 international agencies across the country in various states, mining the social register and providing help to the poor people. So it's no longer only the government efforts in the national cash transfer program, but others are lashing onto the uh, opportunity that these structures and systems are giving them to also provide help. And so, like the last tweet say, if all of us get and do in our small communities, knowing fully well that these people have been identified transparently, they are not being, being the list is not influenced by anyone, then help is getting to the right person. Before we take the next tweet addressed, uh, targeted at the MD of uh, the National Microfinance Bank here, let's take this caller from Makodi. Moses is calling from Makodi. Hello, Moses. Well, it seems the call has dropped now. Quickly, these tweets, there are two tweets here. One is specific to the MD here. The other one has two angles. There's a political angle to it and also an, a palliative angle to it. But let's take this one. Mikel Seidu says, good evening all. My question goes to the MD Nessal Microfinance Bank, sir. Referring to the COVID-19 loan, how does the management intend to get it back, considering that so many people that are jobless and have no means of repaying back are accessing the application? Thank you. Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, I think we are fully aware of that. That is why we gave uh, Central Bank Management, gave what they call moratorium uh, for one year. Subsequently, because COVID persisted, it was extended to year two, based on a need basis. And perhaps, too, the loan is uh, low cost, uh, from 9% that used to be, to reduced to 5%. Banks give as high as 30 40%. So the idea is to give low cost loans so that you can be able to pay back. And I think if you truly use it well, uh, you should be able to pay back because uh, the idea behind it is for those who have businesses, not necessarily uh, somebody who, who is going to marry a woman, uh, buy a car for personal use or acquire liability. No. The idea is targeted at one, you, want, you have a business you want to run, you have a household you are unemployed, you want to generate income, and you pay back. So that is the thinking. Um, we hope the way to pay back, if you don't pay back, we we'll definitely activate what we call global standing structure, as I've earlier mentioned. It will help the recoveries. Also, if you don't pay back, uh, you might be blackmailed in the banking system because you are defaulting your loan. That means you can't get loan any other place, any other bank. And we might even go further to publish your name in the newspapers that you have defaulted. Because if you cannot pay back, it means your brother or sister cannot get the loan. And the institution itself that's granted the loan is at risk of failure. Because once you grant loan, you can't pay back. Uh, it's a loss to the institution. So yes, the conditions were lowered. Because when we start, the conditions were built in. You have to have collateral. You have to have guarantor. You have to look at your cash flow. They are adequate. But people are not getting access to it. And what is the essence of creating a, a package or a scheme? People cannot access. So to allow a greater number of people to access, we will now lower it. We are aware of the risks, and uh, that's why we set up uh, a team for recovery. They have started giving a lot to people to show their mortalization schedule. <coughs> Once your, uh, your payment holiday laps, the two-year mentor I talk about, definitely you'll be seeing my team giving you a lot, giving you messages. And, uh, we are well equipped to look after the call. We are aware they are challenging because it's not cost effective for you to go after somebody who took 200, 300. So definitely we are relying more on technology to see how we can make recovery. But I implore people to please try and recover. Try and make sure they make recoveries. My team is monitoring people uh, electronically, not necessarily physically, because I said it's not effective for you to go and be looking for 200. The cost they are used for 200,000 might be the same thing I use for. 
500 million. So it's not cost effective. So technology is the basis. So I urge you, uh, the government of CBN has done well, the man has done well from CBN perspective. So it's good for people to also do their own part and pay back the loss. Okay. The next tweet has uh, two uh, levels now, and I'll, I'll take them to Paddy Eziela, Nia Kinsiju, and lastly to Ewa Akbera. It says, Buba Yaza is the person that tweet. I am a farmer of Benny seed and sunflower. I suffered a setback in managing my production. Since 2018, none of this program that I have not applied from AGMA's survival phone COVID-19. The issue at stake, most of the managers doesn't know, I'm reading the way it come, who to assist, and politics is playing out in it. Now, before, before I go to Aquara, let me take it to Paddy and me. Paddy, from the MD's perspective, he said, you don't need to know him to, be, to benefit. And you Aquara has talked about the fact that they have done everything to ensure that this whole thing is not politicized by anybody. You don't need to hold a political party card or to know a politician or to belong to any class to benefit. If we sustain all this all through and we don't go through these factors, I believe we'll head somewhere. What's your reaction? Moving forward, and uh, it's gratifying that people are testifying that they have been able to access these facilities without knowing anybody. Even within our team here discussing, somebody has uh, said that uh, what he applied for is being processed. That is good. It means that things are changing generally, not just because of this particular scheme. You know? And uh, it is one thing for something to happen very good, transparently. It's another thing for such a thing to be communicated and for people to believe it. They say seeing is believing. So something has to be done to communicate this, for people to know that people are actually benefiting. Nigerians are not people, there's a saying that we know they carry last. So I don't think that people would see that there is something to benefit and they are not going for it. There is something holding them down. That's some skepticism, that's ignorance and all that. Something has to be done to, to educate people, to enlighten people, to pass on more information, make resources available for communication, for people to really uh, buy into the program, you know, that is uh, designed to benefit us individually and as a whole, as a country. Somebody, an economist in the team has analyzed that when these funds are syndicated, uh, you know, demand is, uh, is, is, is generated and uh, people who produce make money and the economy grows back. I mean, it's as simple as that. So uh, let us communicate more. Let people know that this is working. People are benefiting from it. It is for people who are actually benefiting, for them to talk, to now get other people into it. We are peculiar people in Nigeria that uh, you have to uh, sit up a program, you have to also make resources available to also tell people to come forward and benefit from the program. Me, before I come to you, uh, I hear there's a caller from Josh Sheriff. Hello, Sheriff. Good evening, sir. Good evening, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Why is that the government is very serious about the issue of poverty alleviation? We need to look into so many factors. The basic is that the issue of casual workers that are being employed in most industries, especially the industries which are owned by foreigners. This issue needs to be seriously looked into so as to make our graduates more valuable and to make them more beneficial to our community. That is one. And the second issue is this. The issue of poverty alleviation, we need, as the government is actually trying to uh, put in more money into the system, it's good. Look at, look at the case of BI. BI have series of applicants who have made successful applications which have been granted, but the others are far far easier than those that are uh, than, uh, than, than, than they are requiring. In the midst of this, another thing will be required, another thing will be requested for, which makes it impossible for those to assess such loans. The other case is with me in particular. The next side, the co-finance, I actually applied 
and I did my interview in Kwara since last year June. And up to date, I received no information. And the initial, I could hear the director actually saying, actually they may be trying, but to me, I still see that I need to have received another information after my interview. I think government should look at this very well. Yeah, God assist us. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. I'll allow you to react to Sharif's concern, but let me quickly go to Ni Akinsi. Ni, the second leg to the tweet, uh, Paddy reacted to earlier is the issue of technology. Technology is good, but uh, if you don't look at the safeguards, there's a tendency that there'll be compromise. So, we, we are happier to see a project like this go all through tamper proof. So, what could be done to check the a compromise of the entire structure? Technology comes with its own uh, safeguards, really. And uh, of course, as you are also building uh, those uh, safeguards, uh, there are, of course, experts <laughs> that also want to breach. You know the the safeguards as it were. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule about this. It's, it's an evolving uh, segment or sector of our of our national and international life, as it were. Uh, so uh, it, it depends on the institution that is managing it, that is deploying it, and to be to be very conscious. Um, well, to a large extent, uh, in the in the history of uh, financial transactions in Nigeria, uh, we've not had what you call a blowout, you know, where where technology at the technology deployment and management in that uh, segment of our of our economy at uh, at field, you know, more or less. Uh, to a large extent, we have been growing, you know, and developing with uh, with technology in in Nigeria, and uh, I, I know to a large extent that uh, we also have. Uh, conscious people who are deliberate about what to do with technology in, in the country. And of course, we, we hold a, 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 a strong pedigree in international technology uh, universe, you know, uh, because uh, there are so many Nigerians who are playing big, you know, in the, in, in the international uh, technology space. Uh, and the, the truth, again, is that we cannot run away from technology because that is, it has provided convenience, you know, of transactions, of whatever code, I mean, whatever uh, description, and interfaces, all manners of interfaces. And, of course, if we, we have a large population which is still growing, uh, to get to this population, you need technological de deployment. But thankfully... We can also say that we are advantaged in terms of the way the larger uh, percentage of the Nigerian population had adopted technology. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it now? The, the, the level, the, the, the numbers of uh, phone, phone, telephone density, teledensity in Nigeria is high. We're talking of more than 200 million Nigerians, you know, owning phone. And we have more than 150 million Nigerians that, uh, that have access to the internet, you know. So, uh, and we have about uh, up to 80 million that also have access to broadband facility. So, which means these are the platforms to actually get to Nigerians because you, for every Nigerian, uh, and if we assume that those 200, uh, at the last count, 204 million Nigerians, you know, if they are actually the owners of that, uh, of, of uh, those handsets, or let's net off uh, those people that who's one, two, uh, uh, one, two, three assets and say and assume that a minimum of individual Nigerians that own assets would come to about 160 million. That is, that's a high density. That's a high penetration. So we, we have no choice than to build on those, on those platforms. And they are, they are platforms of convenience because what technology does to you is to, is to facilitate convenience. So I, I, am, I am confident that we will be developing along this line. We have not experienced any, any form of blowouts, you know, and it's not likely we will because there's a serious consciousness and deliberate, I mean, uh, 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 they're being definite, you know, about how, how we deploy 
uh, technology in the country. Thank you so much, Neil. Quickly, uh, Sharif raised a concern regarding the, your, your bank. Yeah, the gentleman from uh, Kwara who called. Yes, we, we, we are aware there are such exceptional cases because it's low demand and supply. Um, demand for the product far outweighs the available force. Uh, you know the law of economy is clear, resources are limited. However, we have uh, tried to engineer our processes by reinventing them, by making it more efficient. So those type of feedback, uh, very soon people will be having feedback on the status of the application. What we have done is to develop our people, redefine our process, and also improve on the technology. In fact, the admin's new automated process is supposed to go live at uh, end of this uh, May. Uh, it's currently undergoing uh, testing. So as soon as we accept the testing, the testing is satisfactory. Uh, we we'll have a more automated and more speed uh, in terms of this bus. We're well, aware there are such cases, but the truth of the matter is that there is demand, is huge, and to cash back it is a problem. No resources are limited. So we we'll try to ensure that even those who get that is what to call geographical spread. So across all the tax systems in the Federation, we'll make sure each one has some portion just to reduce the tension. But some states already have more application than others. So we cannot say, for instance, we should concentrate on Quara and the detriment of maybe Lagos or Kano that have high population density. So whatever we are doing, we look at population density and even spread across states, across the six geographical region. It's noted. Um, we are still working on those that have backlog, but I urge you to be patient. It's a uh, it's an issue around process and other operational challenges. With few months to come, we should be able to overcome it, because the fund itself, as you know, is coming for profit after tax of banks, five percent. So with the impact of COVID now, we expect the fund to dwindle further, and already we have more people queuing. So unless you understand it from that perspective, but what we try to do is first in, first, first out. Unfortunately, you had applied much longer, but I don't know what the reason are. But if I have a way, you can send me a mail. I'll find a way to look at it to address the issues. Okay, so Sharif, hope is not lost. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll go to Aquera, but after the, the last reports, we'll go to Aquera to address a few issues. Then we'll sign him up in Kenya, and then we'll come back to Abuja. So the next time of report begins with Abel Kuta. State is one of the states in the Federation where various intervention initiatives of the federal government in reducing poverty and unemployment have been implemented. Since 2016, when the federal government inaugurated social investment programs, beneficiaries who include unemployed youths and women, especially in rural communities, have become entrepreneurs and employers of labor. No school feeding program. Of course, it's creating employment opportunities for, for our people. In agriculture, the state government is exploring abundant human and natural resources inherent in the state to boost its agricultural production through the federal government intervention programs. Our big border partner is the federal government of Nigeria because under the Anchor Border Program, uh, more than 7,000 young people in the state have benefited from federal, that federal government CPN initiative. The federal government of Nigeria trained extension agents in Ogun State in collaboration with Ogun State government. Beneficiaries rated the initiative as worthwhile and unique. Uh, I'm not able to fortificate one hectare before, but uh, now they introduced me to one hectare. So that is one uh, achievement that I got from the government for what they are, they are doing. We passed through some seminars for us to, and, more, and also a training process which we were taught how to come about this a day hold joiler. Like Oliver Twist, the state government is pleading for more of such relief programs in making life easier for the citizenry. We proceed to Kaduna. Man, popularly referred to as YESCO, is one of the beneficiaries of the numerous federal government youth empowerment programs. 
He was trained in footwear production. Adamu started small and did not despise his days of little beginning. He started uh, in a one, uh, one room uh, apartment shop. And uh, I, when I got the equipment loan, I was able to expand my place. I moved on to this place. This place is about four bedroom flat. You understand? So when we moved to this place, we have more. I was able to accommodate more uh, people in terms of apprentices and even staff. And also our cap capacity of our production also increased. At the moment, Yesco is not only self-employed. He's an employer of labor with more than 20 youths presently acquiring skills under his tutelage. We don't just make shoes because we want everybody to wear shoes. We want something that is durable, something that will last long, something that the customers would enjoy. And this gives I'm is going to help me in a very long way because it's going to make me stand out among people and it's going to help me in so many ways. I have my own bike. I, I'm able to pay my school fees and dress myself. Mahmoud Sani is another beneficiary who specializes in furniture making. His story is similar to that of Adam Yesko, the shoemaker. I'm feeling my family, my mom and my sisters, every of my distant close to me, we they have each other. Stakeholders believe that the federal government youth empowerment programs, if sustained, will make more millionaires in Nigeria and eradicate poverty, give hope to the hopeless, and push the economic growth of the nation faster. Joss is our next stop. Our government initiative is targeted at tackling poverty and hunger across the country. In Plateau State, 26,000 people have benefited from interventions such as the conditional cash transfer, which is meant to empower poor and vulnerable persons. 1,800 breastfeeding and lactating mothers are enjoying from the core responsibility program, while 8,000 youths are beneficiaries of the Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program, GIP. Others include the NPower, and Health and NTeach, where James and Mangai are both beneficiaries. They explain how they utilize the resources for self-development and to enhance their lives. After the expiration of the program, I've been with the healthcare center here also because they extensively trained me on HIV, AIDS, counseling, and testing, which are part of what I'm doing here, and um, collection of um, COVID-19 samples, and once these students are here, I will be able to impact the knowledge. I think this social investment program has come as a savior to the Nigerian youth, because long before now, I was managing my life. So since then, in fact, my life has been improved upon. State focal person of the social investment program, Dr. Sumaye Hamza, says it has been a success story with a group of women saving about 78 million naira in different banks. Batches A and B have already exited. So batch C are in the process of self-validation online and also taking an online test. And because we need to make it transparent, and we need to make it more accurate and enrich the database. That is why the online validation was introduced. The focal person advises beneficiaries to put the monies to good use so that their economic fortunes can be transformed and for the betterment of the society. And our last report tonight is coming from Benue. Grown School Feeding Program has created a value chain employing 6,512 cooks and 50 aggregators across the 23 local government areas of the state. Under the scheme, 487,606 pupils in 2,856 public primary schools are served free and improved nutritious meals, thus helping their mental development and increase in school enrollment of over 20,000. The Empire Scheme is also said to have empowered 
39,000 people, both graduate and non-graduate, and supported with starter packs to start their small-scale businesses after acquiring skills in different vocations. Emmanuel Kuala, they, like other beneficiaries of the program, says the support they received has indeed transformed their lives. This empower is a stepping stone to my own life and to the life of the, of the youth within my community. I could remember when they paid me, I could give it to buy like 52 bars of yams, both rice, half bag of beans, granite oil, palm oil, everything. I was Benry State Focal Person, Nigerian Social Investment Program, Dr. Terrence Damsa says the program is worthwhile and impactful and should be sustained. Like in Benway State now, the cash transfer program also has issues because they say the federal government has issues with the payment service providers. And so they are not paying people in Benway State. When the money is not there, it's difficult for them to go to work. When capturing is not done, when identification is not done, and it's in the case of the conditional cash transfer, the, the state coordinating unit need to go out there to identify the vulnerable populations. Let the report from Makodi concludes the post tonight. And let's quickly go to Akwera, who joins General via Zoom, Zoom in Kenya. Akwera, the first part of the tweet you were to react to talked about uh, the farmer who is a benefit farmer and sunflower farmer. He says since 2018, none of these programs that he has applied for. He called it A-G-M-E-I-S-S, Survivor Fund and COVID-19. He has not gotten it. He is asking why. And the second leg to it is uh, a concern raised by uh, Olari Waju. He says my own question is that how can a ministry ex exist as empower, it's quite difficult here, beneficiaries without adequate provision for their exit. The vice president promised the beneficiaries to exit them into an employment scheme or be given grants to start their businesses. And uh, the last one, he says, please, what is the fate of those who have done the AGSMES interview since May last year? Should he reapply? Just react quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Omi. Um, let's start with the farmer uh, who has applied. Of course, there are loads of opportunities out there. And like the manager for NISA said, uh, resources are not um, limitless. And so uh, the selection process takes quite a while. Uh, you will see from one of the clips that you showed, the Honorable Minister uh, had, um, uh, when uh, launching the Batch C of the Empower, said government will be targeting to receive uh, 1 million uh, beneficiaries into that program. You, then you, you realize that 5 million applied, actually. And from this 5 million, 1 million, uh, through a very rigorous process, uh, will be identified and employed. So uh, we, we, we have that challenge around uh, resources. But I'm sure, uh, as you have uh, applied uh, with... Uh, 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 with a little more patience, I'm sure, uh, help will come uh, your way. And so there are so, uh, um, um, opportunities that are coming uh, um, out there, including the Nigerian Cares Program, which is also an emergency program that will also be uh, beneficiaries like yourself. Uh, we smoke as uh, on the Fatama program, but also other opportunities. Now, the other questions that I uh, came on around. You are Pera, your signal is getting weak. I'm afraid we cannot continue with you, but please say if you can hear me. It was nice having you join us via Zoom in Kenya. You are Pera, is the national coordinator of the National Social Safety Net Coordinating Office, NASCO. Thanks so much for being on Tuesday Live tonight. Okay, now back in Abuja, there's a question here, a, a tweet directed at the MD coming from Abuja, Meileka. It says, my question goes to the MD of Nesan FMB. Boss, please, what is the interest margin of the household COVID-19 targeted loan? Two, 
why are some local government areas not listed on the website? Thank you, from Abuja. Okay, let me start with the bottom uh, question. That's the last question. Uh, I'm not sure how you got the data for the local government. What we have is states. I will cover all the 36 states, including um, FCT. And our data is also, for the, in terms of distribution trend, it's reflected on the base of state, not local government. But probably if you are talking about the branch, branch expansion, I don't know whether you are referring to that. That gradually, which I mentioned in my earlier statement, we might reach there, it's a gradual process. Uh, you cannot graduate from 1 to 774. The human resource to do that is not there, but gradually, we hope that NASA will be in each of the local governments. And the last question around the interest margin. Uh, it used to be 9%. Uh, central bank loans are 9%, but because of the COVID impacts, we know business have closed down. Uh, return on investment might be low. Uh, income generating assets might not do very well. So central bank is always they reduce it from 9% to 5%. They also went further to say, okay, uh, initially they gave us, gave the applicant, or gave us directive that it's five, uh, one year moratorium, and because the COVID is persisting, it's also extending to year two on need basis. So we're going to be looking at those who need it, who qualify for year one, but for year two, you have to justify why you need the uh, payment holiday. But it's not automatic. If you feel you can pay, you can also go as well and pay. But the 5%, you can't get it anywhere in the banking industry. I must say it's a loss, uh, it's a subsidized loan. It's actually a bridge between a grant and a loan. Yeah, let me say middle way. Because the type of uh, condition attached to it are very soft. Okay. So uh, people should be willing to pay. Okay. Me and Paddy Eziala. Uh, that is tweet to the two of you. It's a concern raised by a Nigerian which you can amplify. It's coming from Abdullah Omar Sani Kontagora. The attempt to alleviate poverty by the federal government is a good one, but due to our retrogressive attitude, the effectiveness of the attempt is negated. There is therefore need to access the, assess the, and evaluate the whole process in order to fish out the bad eggs. Paddy, how do you react to this? Bad eggs before the programs even uh, <laughs> start. You know, the programs are just being rolled out. Uh, I'm not heard of the bad eggs yet. And why instead I'm hearing of, about people who have uh, refused to understand uh, or key into what is going on. Uh, of course, we have talked about uh, the use of technology to ensure that things don't go awry, to, to, to ensure that it is effectively, or they are effectively implemented. You know, the, no government will also want the resources to go down the drain. I think uh, efforts are being made also to ensure that uh, people don't fritter away funds. It's tamper proof. You have used that word earlier in this program, uh, at least for now. And uh, the message still goes, please, we cannot start looking for bad eggs when they are not there. But whenever they come up, we will know. And uh, the government will do the needful. Uh, I use the opportunity again to reiterate the need for people to have faith in this program, key into the program, and, uh, and benefit what the program asks questions. Because programs that are rolled out, there are still room for improvement, and these improvements will come when people begin to ask questions, be part of it, and, uh, and suggest experts will also help to suggest the government on ways to improve uh, what's going on. For now, we cannot uh, have a program to benefit people and uh, start looking for bad ex when they have not come up. Thank you. My, my question to you now is looking at it like a summary. Uh, protection and household social assistance, uh, prevention of increase in poverty, including health insurance risk reduction, transformation, tackling inequalities and social discrimination, including, for example, other factors that you know. We, we imagine with all the factors put in place, the safeguards, uh, the tamper pools are protected, the banks are working. Where are we heading to in the next two years, in conclusion? Need 
the question was to me, me a kiss you, please. Saying good things about the program, we are optimistic about what is going on. We are happy with it, and uh, I do not see uh, at the date we are going. What we should be talking about in the next two years is how many people have been reached, how many people, the loans that are to be paid back, how many people have paid back, and where are we, and things like that. But as of going backwards, as of the program is not working, I don't think uh, we should be looking forward to that for now, because the enthusiasm on the part of the various agencies and government uh, is, uh, is, is something that is gratifying. And um, it's, for, it's, for, it's, for, it's for the necessary communication work to be done and for people to come in mass to, to benefit from the program. Next two years, I mean, we look back and say uh, we've got somewhere. But the problem is really serious. It's deep. So well, I'm not saying that in two years' time it's going to be El Dorado, uh, Utopia. No way. Uh, but we can be able to measure. There is inbuilt monitoring, evaluation mechanisms to, to be able to, to look at. You know? uh, I must also say that uh, the social register that has been established by NASCO is a revolution. I have been in one of the programs here on NTA where we were assessing government intervention during the COVID uh, peak, and we bemoaned, we decried the absence of a social register to guide activities of government. But it's no longer, from what we are hearing from APRA, it's no longer uh, the same. I mean, things have improved in that regard. It's for people to tap into this register and uh, do the needful. That's it. Let, let's go to me. Me, quite a short but loaded one way in conclusion, but from, from your end. The concept basically is to understand the dimensions of poverty and vulnerability, and the fact that resource allocation is based on the community. If we sustain this, I believe we'll be somewhere. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of sure. course. Sure. All right. Of, of course, <laughs> we will be. Uh, it's uh, the, the sustainability is important, and uh, of course, I I see uh, a parent uh, mechanism to sustain uh, the uh, the programs as they were. Um, I also, if you if you do an audit of these interventions uh, starting 2016, you will see a, a gradual expansion and enlargement of the universe. Uh, before 2016, we, we must accept the fact that uh, this kind of uh, bouquet of uh, programs uh, were quite uh, strange you know, to our jurisdiction. But uh, since uh, 2016, starting with the uh, National Social Investment Programs, uh, we've, we've seen other forms of uh, programs, you know, in addition to the book here, as it were. So I see an expansion going on. And of course, we should not also forget the fact that it's actually, uh, most of the programs are also transitional in nature. Uh, there will be some that would, uh, of course, uh, uh, be, uh, would naturally exit their, their use, you know. Uh, so, and as those ones, you know, are, are being exited, I am very sure there will be new realities that will need to be attended to. Well, the, the, because there is that target of moving 100 million uh, people out of, uh, out of poverty, uh, from my numbers, uh, if between 2016 and 20, uh, 2019, uh, we've been able to move out more than 25 million people, when they, when that shows effectiveness, it shows, uh, it shows uh, touching base with, uh, with the reality of the situation, resolving the situation. and. Uh, uh, going forward now would be uh, sustaining and, of course, adapting to new realities because there will be new realities emerging, you know, from uh, from uh, our experience. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic, for instance, is one of those new realities that we needed to attend to. And in doing that, the economic stimulus uh, pro program or the economic stimulus plans uh, was uh, was considered and uh, mainstreamed. And uh, a number of uh, projects, I mean, programs in that uh, in that bouquet of programs were were deployed to attend. To the, to the challenges that actually uh, arose from as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in the next two years, we are, we are going to see uh, some new forms of realities. But the important thing is that 
there, there should be enough, uh, there should be enough energy and creativity, you know, on the part of government uh, to be able to, uh, to, to, to identify these challenges and attend to them. But going beyond governance, the, go, go, going be beyond the government, I am believing that the private sector will also key in into this because that should be the major driver of these programs. You know, uh, at the level of corporate social responsibility, at the level of creating the, the jobs and other forms of empowerment, and of course, uh, encouraging entrepreneurship, the private sector should also latch onto some of these uh, ideas and programs as they were. Thank you so much, Ni Akinsiju, investment analyst. It was nice having you on Tuesday Live tonight. And also quickly, Paddy Ezala, communication and development specialist, also publisher, editor-in-chief, development agenda. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for being on the program tonight. Thank you. Back here is uh, Abubakar Abdullahi Kure, MD, Nessal Macrofinance Bank. It was nice having you on the program tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it on the program. We looked at the federal government various programs for poverty alleviation. Thanks for your phone calls and thanks for your tweets. On behalf of all of us, don't forget to support the NTA in the fight against rape and rapist to be a star. Bye-bye.